Jack, yeah. She thought she was being sneaky, but what she didn't know was that I had learned about all of this from a colleague of hers who was disgusted by what was happening. I made my plans and got ready. Fortunately, I had time to manage the anger and prepare for what was about to unfold. It would all kick off tonight, right after dinner. Kayla tonight then? Mary, my friend, inquired. Yeah, I'm finally going to do it. I'll wait until after dinner, hand him a beer, and then I'll fill you in on what happens, I replied. Just remember to stay strong. He won't like it but you have to remain firm. I'll keep that in mind, just as we discussed. He doesn't have a choice. This is how it's going to be. And if he truly loves me, he'll let me do this for my happiness. That's right. Just be prepared for him to yell and scream. He'll resist, but eventually, he'll come to his senses and accept the new reality. It's crucial that you stay calm but firm. Let him have his tantrum, and then he'll realize that you're in charge. That's right. Besides, as far as he knows, this will only be temporary. Once he accepts it, he'll start to enjoy it. Then, it'll just keep going. Are you sure about all this? Jack can be very stubborn. Look, Kayla, Jack loves you more than anything in the world. Sure, he'll get angry, but when he calms down, he'll realize that he loves you so much that he'll do anything to make you happy, even that. Okay, I think you're the expert. Trust me. It took me messing up two marriages to figure it all out, but I perfected the method on my third marriage. You've met my current husband. He is now completely under my control. He even stands next to the bed when I'm with someone else. I also sometimes have him clean up afterward. A month from now, another Jack will get in line as well. Then you can be assured of the security of your marriage to Jack, as well as the pleasure of several other men. I finished the day and went home to cook Jack his favorite dinner. When Jack came home, he greeted me with the words, I love you, and kissed me on the cheek as usual. Despite my best efforts, I was still nervous. This was going to be a significant step and change in our marriage, but it was all worth it. Mary had been telling me about her feminine marriage ministry for quite some time now. I have personally seen it work for her and her husband. He was really happy with how their marriage turned out. I'm sure Jack would love it too. The conversation over dinner was pleasant. We exchanged stories from the previous day and discussed some of the day's news. It was a laid-back dinner for us. After dinner, I insisted that he grab a beer and relax while I cleaned up. He resisted a bit, wanting to help, but I assured him it wasn't much and I could handle it. The leftovers were stored, the dishes went into the dishwasher, and it was time. I poured myself a glass of wine, mentally prepared, and headed into the living room for the conversation. Jack, honey, we need to talk, I began. Sure, honey. About what? Okay, Jack, I realize this might be difficult for you to accept right now, but it's something I really need to do. Please keep in mind that this is only temporary, okay? So, what do you need? If it's that crucial to your happiness, of course, I'll do what I can. So far, he had handled it well, not even bothered. That's good. We've discussed having kids, and I'm almost ready for that but there are a couple of other things I need to do first. It should take a couple of months at most. Then we can start working on having kids. That's great, baby. So what are those things you need to do? Here it is. I took a deep breath preparing for the reaction. Well, Jack, I need to explore a bit before settling down completely. It will be temporary, and then I can be the best wife and mother to our children you could dream of. All right, my love, that sounds reasonable so far. But how are you planning to go about it? Wow he's handling it well. I expected him to freak out. I'll be seeing other men for a while. We'll still make love regularly, but I'll also have love making with other guys to clear my head. Remember, it's only love making with them. You are the only one who has my love. I'll return to you in a couple of months, be your faithful wife again, and then we can start working on having the kids we've planned. Well, Kayla, you don't seem to be asking for my permission, so I assume you've made up your mind. I'd like to go on record saying I'm not in favor of it. If you're asking for permission, I'm not giving it. However, you're a grown woman, so I won't stop you if you think it's necessary. Things were going better than I imagined. He didn't raise his voice, said it conversationally. Mary must be right. Jack will accept the new role I'm preparing him for. So, Kayla, how will this work? Are you moving out or do you expect me to? Are you bringing them here or going to their place or a hotel? Oh, well, we're both going to keep living here. We're married, and as I said, we'll keep making love. 
The other guys will just be lovemaking. With you, it will be making love. I may go to them or bring them here. In those cases, you'll have to sleep in the spare bedroom. I don't see the need for a hotel room since we could just stay here. Again, I'm not in favor, but we shouldn't have lovemaking during this. I won't risk catching any STDs. Once you're done, we'll wait until you're tested and cleared. Have fun, don't worry about me. Well, Jack, can't say I'm not disappointed. I love you and enjoy our lovemaking. But I understand your concern. I'll just have to live with it. That's great, honey. So when do you plan to start your little flings? Well, Mary and I decided to hit a club and meet a couple of guys from work tomorrow night. I'm not sure if it's going to happen, but I might bring one of them back for the night. Since you're not going to have lovemaking with me while I'm doing it anyway, maybe it would be best if you just move into a spare room for the next couple of months. Okay, Kayla. Don't worry about it. I'll take care of moving in by the time you get home tomorrow night, Jack said, before returning to reading the paper. I couldn't believe how mature he was about the whole thing. My heart soared. Sure, he weakly complained and refused lovemaking, but he was completely accepting of everything. He wasn't even the least bit angry. Mary was definitely right. In two months, Jack would be under my thumb. Besides, I knew this lack of lovemaking was only temporary. In a week or two, he'd be back in my bed. Then I would just use the vulvanol wrench to get him to fully embrace his new role as my submissive little hubby. Update. Hi Mary, it's Kayla. Hey girl, so how'd it go last night? Oh my god, you wouldn't believe how mature Jack was about everything. I expected him to go nuclear, but he didn't even raise his voice. He was just so calm and accepting of it all. Wow, that's great. I told you he'd comply. Do you think you'll be able to convince him to watch tonight? I doubt it. In fact, I don't think I'll even suggest it. He said he'd refuse to have lovemaking with me while I'm with someone else. I'm sure that won't last long. After a week or two of using his hands, knowing he has a beautiful woman by his side, he'll be right back. That could be a lot of fun. Since he refused to touch me, I just went ahead and made him move to the spare room. He's packing his things now. He promised me that he would completely move out of the owner's bedroom before I came home tonight. Ha, huh. I love that you changed the name from master bedroom to owner's bedroom. I'm going to have to start doing that myself. Oh, definitely. Anyway, I should probably get ready. I'll meet you at the club. Okay, bye. Bye. Later that night, Jack had made pretty good progress on boxing up all the stuff from my bedroom. I wasn't sure why he really needed to pack when he could just carry armfuls of stuff down the hall. But he explained that it was better that way. It would be less walking, and he could go through everything and leave the things he really didn't need in boxes to get rid of. I guess that made some sense, but I was too busy getting ready to pay attention. He did say how seductive I looked in my underwear, garter belt, stockings, and five-inch loafers. He said nothing when I wore the little red cocktail dress I got for our fifth anniversary last year. That was actually the only time I wore it, but I looked damn good in it. I informed Jack that I was going out and expected to return around 1 a.m., I mentioned that he didn't need to wait for me, as I might not be alone. After saying this, I picked up my clutch and prepared to leave. He assured me not to worry, mentioning that he would have moved out by the time I returned. As he made this promise, he closed the last box. As I left the house, a sense of unease lingered within me, though I couldn't quite identify its source. Despite this, I chose to dismiss it, directing my focus towards the anticipated fun and excitement of the night. At the club, I encountered Mary, Larry, and Josh, the account managers known for their attractiveness and reputed endowment, according to Mary and some of the other office girls. While Jack was moderately endowed, the thought of experiencing a considerably larger member intrigued me, with the added expectation that they knew how to use their assets effectively. In the midst of conversation, Mary asked about Jack's move to the spare bedroom when our first order arrived. I confirmed that he had completed packing and assured me of being entirely moved out by the time I returned. Upon sharing this information, Josh questioned if Jack had indeed made such a statement. I affirmed, recalling Jack's words when I mentioned my expected return time. Our group burst into laughter at the remark, and Larry humorously expressed disappointment about Jack having moved out, as he was hoping to involve him in an carnal setting. I playfully suggested that perhaps after some persuasion, we could consider such arrangements. In the midst of the banter, 
I observed that neither Larry nor Josh had extended an invitation to dance. Over the course of several hours, we engaged in dancing and indulged in drinks. I danced with both of them on multiple occasions, particularly during slow songs, where we embraced closely, feeling their hardnesses against me. Throughout the night, their hands remained on my backside. Later, Mary and I took a break and went to the ladies' room to discuss the conclusion of the night. We decided the outcome of the ride home through three rounds of rock-paper-scissors, resulting in me driving Josh and Mary accompanying Larry. Upon arriving at the house, I led Josh through the front door, noticing that it was dark inside. I assumed Jack had retired to bed by then, reassuring myself that everything was in order. Anyway, we didn't need him watching. I led Josh down the hall to my room. Of course, all of Jack's stuff was gone. Maybe I should reward him by offering him a hand job. There would be something to think about later. Right now, I had other things requiring my attention. It didn't take us long to undress, but Josh wanted me to keep the garter belt and stockings on. I'd lost my thong a couple of hours ago, unsure if it was Larry's or Josh's. It didn't matter, I made enough money to buy others. The next two hours were sheer bliss. We started with start position, then switched to another one to avoid exhaustion too quickly. We finished that round with cowgirl. After a brief rest, I enjoyed when he spanked my ass while I rode him. Maybe I'll let Jack do it on his birthday or our anniversary, but it wouldn't happen again. I'd save it for my other lovers. We ended up in the shower before going to bed, and again when we woke up the next morning. After that, Josh had to leave for his wife and kids. So I put on my robe and went to get some coffee. I felt a bit let down that Jack hadn't brewed coffee yet, considering it was already past nine o'clock. Typically, he'd be up for an hour by now. I planned to address it with him later. I mean, would it hurt him to make me coffee and breakfast, especially after I stayed up late? So much for the handiwork I was going to offer him as a reward for moving into the spare bedroom while I was away. After devouring my breakfast bagel, I headed to the shower and got dressed. The warm water did wonders for soothing my sore muscles. Since I had no plans for the day, I opted for my old shorts and a t-shirt. As I was only going to be around Jack, I wore a functional bra and an old pair of regular underwear. Just as I finished tying my hair into a ponytail, the phone rang. Hey, girlfriend, it was Mary. Hey, seductive thing. So how was Josh last night? He was amazing. It was exactly as I thought it would be. Speaking of Jack, what was his reaction this morning? I don't know. I'm a little angry because he seems to be asleep. I was disappointed that he didn't make me breakfast and coffee this morning. I was thinking of offering him a part-time job for being moved to the spare room. But now, I don't think so. Yes, make sure he knows how disappointed you are and what you expect from this moment. Continue to be aggressive with him, but make sure you give him small rewards when he does something good. This will give him incentive to try harder. I'm actually starting to get angry that he still hasn't gotten up. Wait a minute while I get his lazy ass out of bed. I walked down the hall to the spare bedroom and pounded on the door, shouting his name. No response. I tried again. Still no answer. Finally, I turned the knob and swung the door open. Oh crap, I exclaimed. What's wrong? Mary asked on the phone. Jack isn't in the spare bedroom. His clothes aren't even in the closet. Wait, I said, running through the house. Crap, his truck is gone, as are all his tools. That little stirring in the back of my head was starting to take shape. Oh no, I gasped. What? What is it? Mary asked. Jack moved out. Now I understood what he was talking about. He never said he would move his stuff into the spare room. He only said he would move his stuff out of my room. Then he said he would move in before I returned. I thought he meant he would move out of my room, but he meant he would move out of the whole house. Crap, I need to call him and find out where he's gone. No, no, this is wrong. It sends him a message of weakness. You have to stay strong. Don't contact him. Let him contact you. Trust me, right now he's just having a little tantrum. In a couple of days, he'll come crawling back to you. This is actually a very good thing. Now you have a reason to punish him and make him beg to do something for you to let him come back. It speeds up the process. I bet you could even let Josh or Larry knock you up and make Jack raise the baby. Are you sure about that? I'm sure. Look what my husband does for me. Well, I have to admit, you've been right so far. Of course I am. Oh, and Larry wants to meet you in the supply closet at work for an hour on Monday. 
Can we really get away with that? Sure. At least half the girls are doing it. It's so bad I have to do it on a schedule. I'll email you the meeting time. Just put it down as an appointment somewhere else. Don't worry about it. The boss never goes there, and everyone who needs something there knows to ask me before going to get something. We continued our conversation for a bit longer before ending the call. I must confess, I felt a bit uneasy about Jack's move. Despite my actions, I genuinely love him and envision spending my life with him. Mary's portrayal of a feminine lifestyle sounded appealing, offering me the opportunity to explore various men. Eventually, I plan to give up other relationships, but Jack will remain my devoted and submissive spouse. Perhaps in a few years, I can negotiate with Jack to let me tie him down in exchange for ceasing involvement with other men. Of course, this will only happen when I'm ready to give it up, and he doesn't need to know that. Hmm, yes, I could use binding as a condition for his return. I'd need to consider that. Regardless, I needed to recover from the previous night and brace myself for a demanding day at work tomorrow. I shrugged it off, prepared a simple dinner, enjoyed a glass of wine, and went to bed. Throughout the week, there was no word from Jack. Mary assured me it wasn't entirely unexpected, and predicted he would contact me soon. The longer he stayed away, the more conditions I could establish for his return. This week, I'd been meeting Larry, Josh, and a couple of other attractive guys in the pantry every day, with a double-team session with Larry and Josh scheduled for this afternoon. On Friday morning, during our break around the coffee machine, Larry, Josh, Mary, and I engaged in conversation. Suddenly, a professionally dressed woman approached and inquired if we were Kayla Adams, Mary Morgan, Josh Johnson, and Larry Jones. After introducing ourselves, she handed each of us an envelope and quickly took pictures with a small digital camera. She mentioned that we had all been served and then headed towards our boss's office. I called after her, asking what it was about, and she responded in a sweet southern voice that she was paid to distribute them as a joke, not to read them. She entered the boss's office without knocking. Less than a minute later, she cheerfully left the building, wishing us a good day. Simultaneously, we opened our envelopes, discovering divorce papers citing spousal cheating as the reason. I was frozen in shock. Josh and Larry's phones rang shortly after, their wives having received proof of their infidelity. Their belongings were about to be tossed out, and they were to take turns sleeping. Divorce papers were imminent. Our boss's voice boomed from the office, expressing frustration. He suddenly appeared in the doorway, yelling loudly enough for the entire office to hear. He called for Adams, Morgan, Johnson, and Jones to come into his office immediately. A sense of foreboding settled over me as we walked past him with bowed heads and entered his office, the door slamming behind us. Once inside, he conveyed his discontent, emphasizing that the situation was beyond just bad. He demanded an explanation while waving a manila envelope, but none of us dared to speak. He proceeded to inform us that the company was facing a lawsuit for not adhering to the moral code outlined in our employee handbook. He questioned whether any of us could fathom the reason behind such legal action. Once again, we found ourselves unable to respond. He took it upon himself to explain the situation, stating that the lawsuit revolved around allegations against Mrs. Adams, Mr. Jones, and Mr. Johnson for inappropriate conduct, while Mrs. Jones Morgan was accused of transforming the storage room into a company brothel. He challenged us to deny these allegations and questioned if any of these incidents occurred during business hours or on company property. With no response from us, he expressed frustration and criticized our actions, stating that the court order prevented him from firing us until the case was settled. He instructed us to leave his office until he figured out how to handle the situation. With our heads down, we left his office and made our way to our room. Following that incident, my job became significantly challenging, but I was grateful to still have employment. Deciding to assess the divorce petition, I discovered its severity, containing images, videos, audio recordings, and even notarized letters. An hour later, a company-wide email arrived from the boss, addressing all employees. Management had become aware that employees had repeatedly planned and executed actions contrary to the moral code of conduct detailed in the employee handbook during work hours and on company property. Considering the likelihood of the problem being more widespread than documented, drastic action was announced. 
due to uncertainty about which employees were involved, all employees were required to familiarize themselves with the code of morals in the employee handbook. An online class would be developed over the weekend, and every employee must successfully complete it by the following Friday. Security would conduct spot checks of all secluded areas throughout the day, a measure to be repeated until permanent security cameras were installed for monitoring. Subsequently, the storage room would be locked and the key held by the security supervisor. Any necessary supplies must be brought in with a security escort. The security supervisor would closely monitor computer use to prevent personal use of company assets. Prohibited activities included scheduling non-work-related meetings with co-workers or others, browsing non-work-related websites, and non-work-related text messaging on company computers. Socializing with co-workers should be confined to the break room. During scheduled breaks and lunch periods, security personnel would roam the building to monitor compliance, and the names of those responsible for the actions would not be disclosed. Two minutes later, my email exploded with hate mail from co-workers. After work, the other three and I met at a bar across the street. Seated at a small table in the corner, we faced disapproving looks from other co-workers during Friday happy hour. At least we still have work to do, at least for a while. That was very nice of him. Why do you think Jack I asked about including that in the court order, and Josh dismissed it, suggesting that Jack wasn't trying to cause minimal damage, but rather intended to inflict more pain? I sought clarification, and Josh explained the reference to alimony. He mentioned that, while infidelity was the current reason for the divorce, having a stable job and income could prevent a judge from awarding alimony. He cautioned against the risk of not finding another job if laid off, potentially convincing a sympathetic judge to provide financial assistance. The advice was to stay at the job until the divorce was final. Larry raised a scenario after the divorce, suggesting that if all four of us were laid off, there could be no alimony and no job. Josh responded that in such a case, he would resign on Monday. Larry made a joking comment about being a natural blonde, implying that resigning voluntarily could have legal repercussions. He explained that resigning after filing for divorce might be perceived as an attempt to receive support from the ex-spouse, and it could lead to negative judgments from a judge. The recommended course of action was to hold on to the job and save money. Josh expressed concern about his and my situation, emphasizing that their wives might receive alimony and child support due to having children. He pondered the challenges they would face if laid off, considering that alimony and child support were determined based on income at the time of the divorce. The situation sounded far from promising. Realizing the potential consequences, I felt the need to talk to Jack and attempt to resolve our issues. Despite wanting to assist my friends, the thought of losing my husband made me reconsider my priorities. In a moment of self-reflection, I questioned my initial intentions and concluded that if I needed to prioritize my marriage over my friendships, I would do whatever it took to save it. I swiftly retrieved my cell phone and encountered a message stating that the number I dialed did not accept calls from my number. Frustrated, I requested Mary's phone, explaining that Jack had blocked my number and I needed to discuss the storm issue with him. After attempting to call him on Mary's phone and receiving the same message, it became evident that he had also blocked her number. When suggested to try Larry's phone, I hesitated expressing concern about the potential consequences of calling my husband from one of my friend's phones. Acknowledging the difficulty in reaching him by phone, I felt a sense of panic, considering that Jack had likely blocked my home and work phones as well. Realizing that talking on the phone might not be effective, I decided to seek him out in person. The urgency to find him and address the situation face-to-face -face took precedence over any concerns about societal expectations for women in marriage. Reflecting on the changes in my perspective, I recognized that just that morning, I had entertained thoughts of making Jack beg and grovel to come home. Now, the tables had turned, and I found myself uncertain of the roles we would play in the resolution of our situation. I picked up my phone and started going through my contacts. Sure enough, at least one of his friends knows where I can find him. Spoiler, none of our mutual friends knew anything. Well, that wasn't exactly true. None of the previous mutual friends who remained friends with me knew anything. The numerous mutual friends who now hated me knew enough. Unfortunately, while they had no reservations about letting me know they knew where I could find him, 
they defiantly refused to reveal that information to me. I was met with laughter when I asked if they'd give him a message from me. I had just dejectedly finished my last call and fourth drink. That's when Josh showed his intelligence. Yes, it was said sarcastically. Maybe it was just my mood or the result of the differences between how a woman thinks and how a man thinks. Perhaps some of you will think that what Josh suggested was really brilliant. Me? I don't think so. Well, Josh began, since our lives are already messed up, why don't we go to Kayla's and spend the whole night as a foursome? We've already been carnal, so we can take advantage of that and have a night of passion. He thought that was sound logic, maybe to him, but I'd just received a big dose of common sense. Of course, if there's nothing left to lose, there might be something to think about. Personally, I think Jack and I still have a tiny chance. That tiny chance would evaporate faster than a drop of water on the surface of the sun if I took everyone into the house and had a late-night gathering with them. I politely declined and offered to let Mary take them home. I had a husband I was trying to get back. I tried everything to find Jack. On weekends, I drove around motel parking lots for hours looking for his truck. I drove past all his friends' houses at different times to see if his truck was there. I even tried to follow his best friend. When I saw him leaving his house, hoping he would go to where Jack was, it was all in vain. Monday morning, I camped across the street from his work. Everyone came in, but Jack never showed up. I waited another hour. Still nothing. Even though I was already late for work. I didn't care. Screw it. They weren't going to fire me right now anyway, and I'd still get fired after the settlement, but that didn't matter. I got out of the car and headed for the office. I saw that the door to Jack's office was closed, so I asked the receptionist. If Jack was here, she told me he was gone for two weeks. Crap. The boss threw me an angry look when I walked in two hours late. I didn't care. All the phones I could have used are blocked. His friends refused to help. I can't even get a message to him at work. I have no idea where he is, so I can't show up on his doorstep. Mail is not an option because I have no idea where to send it. What are my options? Email. He always checks email. I just have to hope he doesn't block my emails. No problem with attempting, Jack. No excuses. Won't waste time trying to provide one. I've contracted the fool's disease. My decision, not blaming Mary. It was wonderful hearing her talk about women's marriage. No idea why I thought there was a chance you'd accept. Should have known better. Sorry for needing a wake-up call, but now I'm awake. I want you to know I'm deeply embarrassed and regret my actions. I understand you may not accept it. Jack. Despite my recent actions, I truly love you completely. You did nothing wrong. It was me being an incredible idiot and selfish. Jack, my love, even though I don't deserve it, I beg you to forgive me. I need to come back and I'm willing to give you anything. I realized the foolishness of trying to create Fel M, but I'd be thrilled to be part of MLF. Yes, Jack, I'm giving you my soul and you're just giving me orders. I'll literally do anything to get back to where I belong, with you. I know the definition of anything. Please, Jack, I'm offering you anything. Despite no interest in women, I'd do things for you. Serve you and friends at a Super Bowl party in only a garter belt, stockings and high heels, if it brings me back to you. If you want me in a certain way, tell me to bend over the nearest chair, regardless of who's watching. Spank my spine cheeks with a leather belt? Tell me when and where. I'll bring the belt. No reason to trust me, but I'll put on a chastity belt and give you the keys as a condition for my return had blood drawn for an STD test, results in a couple of days. Tell me where to send them and I'll get them to you. Jack, no matter what happens, you're the best person I've known. I know you'd never intentionally hurt me, even though I probably deserve it. I accept it all, not asking you to forget or trust me again. I'm asking for the opportunity to be yours in any capacity you desire. I ask for nothing more than to come back to you forever. Even if I have to agree to a divorce or watch you with other women, I pray it doesn't happen, but I realize it's not my decision. I'm at fault, and I recognize you might want to even the score. Goose goosey, all that stuff. What about Mary, Larry, Josh, and the lawsuit against my company? Mary manipulated me into agreeing to this plan. Josh and Larry took advantage of that. As you know, I'll be fired once the lawsuit is settled. It's all our fault. Do what you want with them. I'll help if you want. After all, I'm your willing slave from now on. Your loving slave, Kayla. Update. Fortunately, Jack hasn't blocked my email yet. Even more surprising is that he actually read it. No, he didn't take my word for it. After all, 
I'd already broken the biggest vow I'd ever made, the one about leaving everyone else behind. Since I'd broken that promise, what could make him think I wouldn't break any other promises? All I could do was prove it to him, one action at a time. Two years had passed since I sent that letter. Josh and Larry faced challenges in their divorces, and all four of us were terminated the day after the lawsuit against the company was settled. Eventually, Josh and Larry found lower-paying jobs and moved into a small apartment in a rough neighborhood. Their social lives suffered, and their ex-wives turned the kids against them. I realized both women are now in better relationships. Now it's my turn. Currently, I'm kneeling undressed beside the bed, wearing a chastity belt while Jack finishes. This is my penance. I detailed all of this in a letter. Yes, Jack wanted to test me to see if I would honor those words. If I want him back, I don't have much choice. It was a tough six months, but eventually, he eased up a bit. He still makes me do it sometimes, like now, but it's improved. Now, he only brings other women home once every two months. After getting fired, I stopped working. Jack got a promotion, and we manage just fine without my income. I stay home, taking care of our two-year-old twins. I'm undressed most of the time, though Jack recently said, I need to start wearing clothes at home soon. The kids are getting old enough that it feels weird otherwise. Right now, I only wear clothes when leaving the house, or when we have guests. I still answer the door undressed for deliveries. I underwent laser hair removal, so I have a permanent landing strip over my genitals. This makes it impossible to hide my jack tattoo on the right side of the band and jack tattoo on the left side. Every week, Jack updates the five red stripes on my buttocks with a leather strap. Right after the fifth stroke, he removes my plug and engages me backfully as I lean over the couch. I'm not perfect. Sometimes there are more stripes on my buttocks or chest when I mess up, but I genuinely enjoy it. Who knew the sting of a strap-on could cause a bond? Mary. Well, she's still married. True, she got fired as well, but no one anticipated her facing any significant consequences. Her husband seemed entirely submissive to her whims. She'd easily find another job, and life would continue for her. Life isn't always fair, right? Actually, it is. Harold wasn't the submissive loser everyone believed. Once he gathered evidence, he got furious. I thought I had a tough six months, but compared to hers, it was a walk in the park. Deciding he had punished her adequately, he served her with divorce papers. While putting Mary through hell, he quietly liquidated all their assets and safeguarded them. He gave her the house after refinancing it and taking all the equity, then vanished. She lost the house, and all the money disappeared. She found another job, but for half the salary she used to earn. She also has a tarnished reputation, but is not dating presently, with another month of antibiotics ahead. You might be wondering why I endure this, or laughing at my deserved fate. If you're upset because Jack didn't leave me stranded, I thank God every day he didn't, though I deserved it. I endure it because I can't fathom being without the love of my life. Yes, Jack whips and humiliates me, but he still loves me. He has other women, but never without me. I can leave any time, and Jack showed me divorce papers where he'd be fair. I declined the offer. He's an excellent father, lover, and husband. I don't need anything else. I got so caught up in the idea of women's marriage that I lost sight of what truly matters. Instead of being content in an equal relationship, I became subservient to my husband. It wasn't intended, but I'm content.